Well, good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. I can say that this morning. Hopefully it will be a good year. We appreciate you coming to our Launchpad lecture this morning. We're going to talk about uh, John Glenn. And this month, in 1998, that would have been, what, uh, 24 years ago, NASA announced that he would be returning to space doing geriatric studies on STS-95 uh, orbiter discovery. So we're going to, that'll be discussed in our presentation today. But first, I want to bring something up. Some months back, did Chris leave? Yes. Okay, Chris, our director, sent around an email that said, why do so many people from Ohio want to leave the planet? <laughs> <laughs> and I did a little bit of research. There are 25 astronauts from the Buckeye State. But that's not the most. There are 26 from California. Well, that makes sense. Now, yeah, I, I could understand why people would want to leave California. So there are more astronauts who want to leave California, Chris, than there are that want to leave the state of Ohio. I wanted to leave California. <laughs> <laughs> I lived there for nine years. I know that feeling. Now, I'm thinking that Ohio stands for our heritage is overhead, which is why so many astronauts or folks want to leave uh, Ohio. But just in comparison, Illinois has 13, Indiana has 12, Michigan 13, New Jersey 13, Pennsylvania 20, and Texas 23. Uh, we have five astronauts who are living in New Mexico. Three of them were born here, Dr. Harrison Schmidt from Silver City, Drew Gaffney from Carlsbad, and Sid Gutierrez from Albuquerque. Uh, Mike Mullane lives here, but he's from Wichita Falls, Texas. And Ed Mitchell was born in Hereford, Texas. So if you've ever been through Hereford, I actually spent a night in Hereford one time. <laughs> So yes, today, uh, 24 years ago, on January 16th of this month, NASA announced that John Glenn would be returning to space on the STS-95 discovery. Now, when you talk about someone such as John Glenn, I think first you need to lay a foundation. Of what actually makes John Glenn? What makes the man? Well, he was, of course, raised in Ohio in a family that had great religious faith in God, and he would pass that on to his children, and his wife had that as well. Uh, he was a young man, about 20 years old, when he discovered that the Department of Commerce in the United States was looking for students to train to be pilots. And he signed up for that program, and in a pretty quick manner, got his pilot's license. Sometimes timing is everything. He gets his license, and six months later, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor. And so where would a pilot in that era go to sign up? He went to the Army Air Corps. And they said, well, you know, we, uh, no, we don't want you. And so he went to the Navy. And the Navy said, well, we're going to send you over to the Marines. <laughs> and that is how John Glenn became a Marine pilot. Uh, he would fight, see combat in World War II. He would see combat in the Chinese Civil War, which actually lasted from 1927 to 1949. And he was seeing combat toward the end of that. He shot down three MiGs in Korea. And for his service, he earned six distinguished flying crosses and 18 air medals. In 1957, he set a transcontinental speed record from Los Angeles, see there's somebody else wanting to leave California, <laughs> uh, to New York in three hours and 23 minutes. Uh, the first transcontinental flight to average supersonic speed. And of course, what do you get from that? Uh, you get a ticker tape parade, and we'll show you some of those pictures a little bit later. Uh, the same year he appeared on television's Name That Tune, if you, uh, if you have ever seen that old program. I tried to find a video clip of it online. The only thing I could find was when Paul Harvey was doing his rest of the story, that was one of his rest of the story subjects, but I was unable to find a video clip on, uh, online. Here are some photographs from his time in the service. You see him as a, a young fighter pilot here. This picture on the bottom, I think, is an absolutely amazing photograph. You have to admire the photographer who took that picture. And the information where I found it is that 
that photograph was actually a black and white photograph and it was hand tinted in color. So the pilot who flew the plane that allowed uh, the photographer to get that photograph and who's in the very first plane right there is none other than John Glenn. He took on some of his missions flak and there you see damage to his airplane and then there's him as a very young fighter pilot and of course this one right here wearing his navy hat assigned to the United States Marine Corps. He married his high school sweetheart Annie on the left, you see a photograph, uh, photograph of them as high school sweethearts. They were married for 73 years and eight months. It was an amazing love story. She had a stuttering problem for a, a large part of her life, which he supported her in overcoming. And then the two of them became advocates together to help kids in school overcome uh, stuttering, if that was a, a, something that they were dealing with in their life. You see them on their wedding day, right here. In the upper right, you see them later in their marriage when he became a uh, United States Senator. And below, you see them about four years before he passed away. Now, in all those photographs, do you notice anything? Nearly, not always, but nearly every photograph, he's wearing a bow tie. Uh, that was kind of his signature. In the bottom right, he isn't, but you'll see in a lot of photographs that he uh, wears a bow tie. They had two kids, John and Carolyn, and in nearly every photograph with his kids, you're gonna find an airplane somewhere in that picture. <laughs> so NASA chose him as one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, and there you see the Mercury 7 with Werner von Braun, and you see him with his bow tie on, when the rest all have ties. There was a story that I've read in a couple of books that John Glenn was sort of the conscience of the original Mercury 7. If you've ever seen the movie The Right Stuff, you get a sense of that. They like to go out, they're suddenly famous, they like to go out and party a lot. And he would tell them, guys, you need to go home to your families, you need to set a better representation of what American astronauts representing this great country are like. And so he was somewhat their conscience. As I said earlier, he had a great religious faith that sort of supported him in that. And he uh, passed that on to his kids. And as one example of that, one Christmas, he sat his kids down together and he said, you know what, we're not giving each other presents this year. Now as a kid, that would be devastating. He said, we're going to find a family in our community and we're going to see what they need and we're going to meet those needs. And so they found a family in the area in which they were living where the mother had run away and abandoned the family and left the father on a farm with, with several kids. And they pooled their money and they found out what that family needed and they, uh, they met those needs. They blessed that family. And so that was the kind of thing that he uh, passed down to his kids. These uh, gentlemen right here to become the original Mercury 7, including John Glenn, underwent some rigorous, rigorous testing. There were a hundred applicants. NASA wanted experienced test flight. John Glenn had experience in the F-106B. They interviewed 32 candidates out of that 100 and they uh, pared it down to these seven right here. And to get these seven they underwent psychological tests, physical tests, mental tests, and once John Glenn was accepted, they were all assigned a different area to accomplish something in the Mercury mission. And he was assigned to design the cockpit and controls in the Mercury capsule. And of course, every one of these men wanted to be the first American in space. And you can imagine the disappointment of the others when Alan Shepard was chosen. And they were all like, oh, congratulations. John Glenn actually went up to Alan Shepard, shook his head, uh, his hand, and said, congratulations to you. Which has always made me wonder, I've never been able to find out if that might have had something to do with the fact that when Alan Shepard was in mission control and John Glenn launched on his mission, it was Alan Shepard that said, God speak on John Glenn, returning that courtesy that John Glenn had given to, uh, to him. So once they were chosen astronauts, uh, they underwent flight testing. And this is one of the few photographs he's not wearing his bow tie. 
<laughs> and there he is in his suit preparing to uh, become the first American in space. To prepare for this day, he spent 25 hours and 25 minutes in the capsule. He performed hangar tests. He performed altitude tests. He spent in the simulator 59 hours and 45 minutes. He flew 70 simulated missions and reacted to 189 simulated failures, which probably worked to his advantage because there were severe problems prior to his mission taking place. Each one of the astronauts was allowed to name their own capsule, and because of the bond that had formed between him and his six fellow astronauts, Mercury astronauts, he named his the Friendship 7. And there you see the original design, and you see it once it's actually painted onto the capsule. Mike? Yes? you know who took these pictures? I think these were probably just NASA publicity photos. Do you know? Yeah, it was my godfather. Really? Danny Patneski. Oh my gosh. He was That's... the NASA photographer. Really? Yeah. He took my baby pictures. <laughs> <laughs> There's a real professional photographer. <laughs> that's impressive. I'm, that's a very impressive. <laughs> so there's the actual capsule with Friendship 7 on it. And this man right here uh, was a former Luftwaffe pilot in Germany, came over to the United States following the war. That's Gunter Bent. And he ran the White Room. Uh, he was extremely strict, and it was John Glenn that gave him the name Der Fuhrer of Der Launch <laughs> So, I want to just kind of step aside here for a moment and talk about some of the issues that preceded the astronauts going up. And that's where Ham and Enos come in. Ham and Enos, who were trained at Holloman Air Force Base, that's Ham on the left, that was an acronym for Holloman Aeromedical, and Enos on the right. There were, there were scientists, doctors, engineers who thought that once a sentient being got into weightlessness, into space, that the body would cease to function. The heart wouldn't work in weightlessness. And if your heart's not working, it's not pumping your blood, it's not going to your brain, and guess what? You're going to die. And that's part of what what science is about, there were scientists who, prior to us setting off the first atomic bomb here in New Mexico, were convinced that it would set off a chain reaction and blow the earth up, but we did it anyway. And there were engineers who thought that once the lunar module landed on the surface of the moon, it would sink and they wouldn't be able to lift off again because it would cause the craft not to be perfectly aligned. So that's why you see those big pads on the bottom of the lunar module, and that's why you see Neil Armstrong actually have to jump off the ladder because they expected the lunar module with those pads on it to sink down to where he could just step off of it. But there were the uh, doctors and others who thought that a human being would not be able to survive in space, and so these two chimpanzees were sent up Ham preceded Alan Shepard, and Enos preceded John Glenn, and they were able to prove, without going into great detail in their story, that a sentient being could perform tasks in space and survive. And that paved the way for Alan Shepard lifting off, and that paved the way for John Glenn lifting off as well. So, John Glenn was set to lift off aboard Friendship 7 on December the 20th of 1961. Now we all know that's not when he lifted off. Uh, there were weather issues, there were mechanical problems. The mission was delayed nine times until February the 20th. And finally on, on launch day he prepares, to, uh, he prepares to undertake his mission. There's an important thing that needs to be brought out, and that is there was a, a great conflict between the astronauts. They were pilots. They are used to controlling their aircraft. And the engineers who basically wanted to design something where the 
astronaut is just sitting there saying, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, and have no control whatsoever. That's kind of the way it was with the Soviet cosmonauts. They were ejected out of their capsules when they came down, and they were just along for the ride to report on what happened. But these are pilots, and they're guys, and they want to control the situation. And so there was a, a great disparity between those factions. Fortunately, the pilots won, and that will become evident why it was uh, fortunate here in a little while. So you see him suiting up, you see him getting his medical uh, uh, devices placed on his body, and this is an amazing photograph that the Associated Press took. This is a globe of stars around the planet Earth the night before he lifted off, and John Glenn is actually looking through that globe into an area he's going to be into the next day, looking at the planet Earth, the place that he is leaving. He walks out to his uh, capsule. And it lifts off. And Alan Shepard says, Godspeed, John Glenn. So this right here, uh, these came out of our archives, and this will show you the trajectory of the basic mission. What happens, the Atlas lifts off, when the booster engines are shut off, when the spacecraft is separated by rockets and eventually where uh, he parachutes back down and splashes down very successfully. Uh, these are the uh, flight paths of the three orbits in which he accomplished. And this right here shows the listening station. And you'll notice number 15 is right here in this area at White Sands. So we had a listening station here. There's also a listening station out there near the Launch Complex 33. It's a small bunker, and that was used for the Gemini program. So this area right here was extremely crucial in keeping track of those astronauts as they uh, orbited around the Earth and they, they came over the area in which we live. This photograph right here is a, uh, taken from part of the film of John Glenn during his mission. and then all of the newspaper articles that came out. Some of them actually were printed before the mission was over as special editions and were on the stands so that people could keep up with what was going on. Now here is where it's important to understand why the pilots needed to be in control. So John Glenn lifts off. And the folks in mission control notice that a sensor reading is telling them there is a problem. And the problem is the retrofire pack. And the sensor is telling them when they get rid of the retrofire pack, once he's up, that it's going to pull off his heat shield. And without a heat shield, He's going to come back through the atmosphere in temperatures of at least 3,000 degrees. And a human being without a heat shield is not going to survive those. So in mission control, they're trying to figure out what to do. And they start asking him questions. They don't tell him why they are asking these questions. But he said later that I kind of figured out pretty quickly that there was a problem with my heat shield. But I was too busy doing other things to, to let them know that I knew what was uh, actually actually taking place. Uh, there you said, guess who's in the background? It's the president. Every, the family is uh, the important thing in this photograph right here. That's his mom and dad and their daughter, Carolyn. And there you see him once they're back down. So, back in orbit, they're trying to figure out what to do about the sensor that tells them he's going to lose his heat shield. When he comes back through the atmosphere, there's about, uh, there's an area, I think they call it the ionization uh, part of the sky, where you can't communicate. So mission control can't talk to him, and he can't get instructions from mission control. They know that there's an issue with the retro pack. They did not eject it. 
and he takes control of his of his capsule to fly it back through the atmosphere. And he would say later that as I looked out the window, I could see molten pieces of the retro pack flying by my window. And you saw that newspaper headline earlier where it said, it's hot in the capsule, but I feel fine. And he was able to guide it safely down and splash down without any issues whatsoever, proving that pilots need to have control of their equipment. That became an issue during the moon landing as well. If you watch our Apollo 11 movie down at the theater, you hear Neil Armstrong say that when the lunar module Eagle got to the place it was supposed to touch down, Neil Armstrong looks out the window and it's a football-sized field of boulders. And they're going to crash. That's their automatic system. So he takes control and flies it, lands safely, and when he touches down, there's 16 seconds worth of fuel left. So fortunately, win one for the pilots, zero for the engineers. <laughs> and there is the capsule in uh, which he flew his mission. Uh, you really have to trust the folks who design these systems to crawl into that, get locked in by Gunter Vent, and l have a rocket lit underneath you. You can see just how minor the space is inside there. One of the neat things uh, about this mission, he was the first American to witness a sunset more than 100 miles above the Earth. His mission was the first that took the first panoramic photo of the United States. He talked about the snow white mantle covering high mountains, the rich deep green of Bahamian waters, the sculptured sands of the deserts. It's got kind of a poet's heart here. Uh, he talked about peering down at volcanoes and saw avalanches told of sun reflecting off the clouds and the highest spires of the great cities. And the other neat thing about this mission was his heartbeat was actually broadcast, a heartbeat broadcast for the first time from space. And this right here is actually in a, in a display on the, what is that, the third floor here at the museum. And you can see that actual tape from his mission up there on display. And as part of that, a book was written when he returned back to Earth called P.S. I Listen to Your Heartbeat because a young man wrote John Glenn a letter and said, P.S. I Listen to Your Heartbeat. And that uh, book is in the display as well. Uh, by the way, Glenn's heartbeat which was already more than 100 beats per minute as he's coming back through the atmosphere, went to 134 beats per minute at 55,000 feet altitude. And at that point, they manually deploy, uh, deployed the drone shoots that brought him back safely to Earth. Uh, if you watch our Apollo movie, you're going to see how cool Buzz Aldrin was. Because at liftoff, Neil Armstrong's heartbeat rate was 110, I think. Uh, Collins's was 99. And Buzz is 88. <laughs> taking all those keys. So Friendship 7 splashed down safely, uh, 800 miles southeast of Cape Canaveral. It was a four hour, 55 minute flight. He carried a note on the flight which read, just in case there were an issue, I am, I am a stranger, I come in peace, take me to your leader and there will be a massive reward for you in eternity. <laughs> in several languages, depending on where he might have come down on the planet Earth. Especially if he came down uh, near the Southern Pacific, Southern Pacific Islands. What's that? I thought it was Star Trek. Yeah. Take me to your leader. <laughs> <laughs> Another first for John Glenn. All right. He addressed uh, the Congress. I actually found this record right here at a thrift store in town many years ago for about a buck. And it includes actual audio from his mission and his talks before the United States Congress. And it's fast. You can find it if you want to listen to it. It is online. It's, it's fascinating to, to listen to. He has a great sense of humor. One of the stories he told was when he came back down, he's with the president and his family. And here's John Glenn. He's just become the first American to orbit the Earth. He's accomplished this great feat. He's piloted his capsule in a precarious situation, and Carolyn, the president's daughter, who's a very young lady, said, well, what about the monkey? 
He didn't impress her. She wanted to meet the chimps or the monkeys. <laughs> and then, of course, there's a, a ticker tape parade, and these show the many different ticker tape parades over the over the course of his career and his flights with the president, the vice president, Lyndon Johnson, and others. Now, as far as I know, all of the astronauts got a ticker tape parade, but only John Glenn got a record done about it. And if you've never heard this, this is probably one of the campiest records that you will ever hear. It's Walter Brennan doing the epic ride of John Glenn. And if you want to listen to that, you'll find that on YouTube as well. But I warn you, it's very campy. <laughs> Afterward, back at NASA, uh, John Kennedy, the president, uh, came for a presentation. You see the capsules there. Uh, he awarded him a Distinguished Service Medal from NASA. You see the director of NASA in the center of them there. And then the president got to peer inside that capsule himself. I don't think they let him sit in it, but he got to actually peer inside of it. And one of the final things Glenn did was visit the White House after his mission, and he presented a United States flag to the president that he carried with him on his mission. So that, that's an amazing thing that he did, but that's just part of his career. That's just basically the first third of his life. The, the next part of his life was entering the political arena. And after he came home, the volume of mail that he got was so massive that he couldn't sift through the letters alone. So he had to get folks help him go through them, set them out. And it was amazing how the post office got those letters to him. Some writers wrote, Glenn, USA. Some of them just put a picture of him on their envelope. <laughs> uh, many of the letters were heartwarming, some were not heartwarming. Some offered advice or they asked for help. But eventually, he answered in his own handwriting every one of those letters. A Pennsylvania woman wrote to him, I'm very happy that you made such a successful journey into space, John. But if you had continued on up to heaven, I know you would have been equally as welcome. An 11-year-old Californian asked, what happens if you're in a space helmet and your nose itches? <laughs> and he said, it's torture, but you'd be surprised at how adept one becomes at nose wriggling without having anything to rub against. <laughs> An elderly woman, and, and this gets back to the, the character that is at the foundation of John Glenn. An elderly woman wrote him and asked him for an autograph. And her husband, also wrote a letter that reminded John Glenn that he had met her on an airplane and she had signed, or he had signed her ticket. Hmm. And unfortunately, the ticket agent took that ticket away. And so the husband wrote and said, you know, our son was just killed in, a, in an airplane accident. And would you write something to her to give her strength. And he wrote, at a time like this, it's easy to lapse into feeling that we should blame God for something cut short of what we think it should have been. But it seems to me, rather than looking at it that way, we should be thankful for the happiness and joy that we have been permitted to take part in, even though for a comparatively short time. So as I mentioned, following his 1961 mission, uh, Glenn addressed a uh, uh, session, or following his mission, rather, Glenn addressed a joint session of Congress. He said, I feel we're on the brink of, of an area of expansion of knowledge about ourselves and our surrounding that is beyond description or comprehension at this time. And boy, was he right. So he decides to enter the political arena. Bobby Kennedy, he also retired from the Marines, came to him and said, run for office. So Glenn decided to set his sights on the U.S. Senate from the state of Ohio. And at the time, he was actually registered as an independent. And neither party understood it. The Democrats thought he was a Republican. And the Republicans thought he was a Democrat. So he ran, and he was doing well until he had an accident. He fell in his home in the bathtub and hit his head. 
and became dizzy and suffered vertigo for several months and he had to get through that first so he withdrew in February of 1964 and guess what people wrote him letters of support here come the here come the mailbags of letters one said if I begin to hear a ringing I chew gum vigorously another said I believe we can treat the eternal ear with cold light crystals like the lightning bugs I am a rock hound and believe in crystals Another said, a suggestion for your moments of dizziness. Hold your breath until it subsides. <laughs> so he uh, gets elected. He, he runs the next session, which would be six years down the road. He runs. He gets elected. And the mail starts to show up again. One woman said, you have an exalted position in the minds of all Americans, and I was sorry to hear it. You're going into politics. <laughs> A woman from Massachusetts wrote, politics is only for men who can't do anything real but talk their heads off. <laughs> a Michigan mother wrote, and now you're running for the Senate. Where have your principles gone? <laughs> but he was persistent and he would serve, I think, 24 years in the United States Senate. He takes the oath of office. You may recognize Barry Goldwater there, who actually gives him the oath of office. So that's the second third of John Glenn's uh, life. And then we get into the latter third, and that was the opportunity for him to return to space on the space shuttle Discovery. There, and I remember what this happened. There, was, there were a lot of rumors and mudslinging flying about. And a lot of folks said, because he was a retired Democrat senator, that the president at the time, Bill Clinton, was only letting him do this because he was a Democrat. Which really wasn't true. He had to go through all of this training. He had to qualify for everything. His studies would basically be geriatrically based while he was in space. The oldest person, I still think the oldest person ever to go to space. But you don't just take a favor and go through all of that training if somebody has just given you something. He had to earn his way back onto that shuttle orbiter. And you see him above uh, the water tank in Houston doing, his, doing that particular training. Uh, you see him preparing to suit up when the shuttle lifts off. You see him in the white room at this point. Uh, I don't think Guter Vent was there anymore. He was retired, but he was still alive at the point. And then you see him with NASA, NASA's administrator, Daniel Golden, there when he touches back down. And he was very successful in, in helping medicine and study geriatric issues and, and things such as that. He flew from October 29th through November 7th of 1998. Uh, his return to space provided valuable physiological and psychological research on the physiology of aging. Scientists learned the aging process and the space flight experience share a very similar number of physiological responses. And NASA said the results of this research may help counter some of the aging processes of people who are living here on Earth. And whether you realize it or not, there's a, a website you should investigate if you have an interest called Spinoffs. There are probably more than 8,000 things that we use everyday medicines, uh, weather satellites, all kinds of cell phones. If you have a cell phone miniaturization for taking things into space, you really cannot get through a day of your life without using something that comes out of NASA technology. So a lot of us uh, in this room right now are probably at the point where the aging studies that came out of that many years ago, we will be able to use to our advantage. So John Glenn's life really in, in three parts. Uh, his initial years as an astronaut, his, his secondary years in, in the Senate, in the political arena, and then, of course, his latter years back to, uh, back to space and the things that he accomplished at that point. When he passed away, uh, he was, of course, given a military funeral. And once again, one of those 25 great astronauts from the, from the Buckeye State, the state of Ohio, 
and I actually have that. That's Ohio Magazine that did a story on him when he returned to space on the uh, on the shuttle Discovery. So that's our presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm sure somebody in this room will be able to answer one of those. Yes, sir. How old was he when he returned to space? Um. Yeah, 77, 76, 77. Uh, I know a lot of people who are 77 don't want to go to the grocery store, <laughs> <laughs> let alone go to space. <laughs> yes? And he would, medically speaking, they had so much medical history from the first time. Yeah. And they, I mean, astronauts go through a lot, you know, medically speaking. And they, they understand every part of your anatomy when you go up. And it was an interesting snapshot to take that original set of information when he was in his 30s and when he was in his 70s. It was yeah, just a, a to compare, no oh, sorry, in his 40s and in his 70s, you know, to compare and contrast. Um, we haven't had that kind of thing with a young astronaut in the Mercury program to a, obviously a shuttle pilot. We never had that before. So. Uh -huh. That's a good point, yeah. It, it kind of goes in line with something I saw a presentation Chris was making yesterday, and he talked about the Kelly brothers from Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, one stayed on Earth, one stayed, one went to space for a year, and they'll be watching them to see how that experience over a year affected him versus what his twin brother is is undergoing here on the planet Earth. So it, it was an amazing opportunity. He earned he earned that right to go there, and. I don't know how else you get that data unless unless somebody like that who had been there before and is now back and you can compare the two experiences. Yes, Brad. Ohio have a special museum for him or um you know, I don't think Neil Armstrong has one in Wapkanet, Ohio, but I don't think they have one for John Glenn. Uh, <coughs> I'd love to visit it. <laughs> I've never found anything online that talks about it. But if you're ever on Interstate 75 north of Dayton, stop at the one in Walpock. Actually, there is a John and yep. Amy Glenn Museum in New Concord, Ohio. Oh, is there really? Yeah. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I go to Ohio. <laughs> so it might have been killed by the pandemic. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. John and Glenn was on You Bet Your Life with yeah. Groucher Marx in 1957. Was he? Yeah, I was in his uniform here just to test by him. I'll have to look that up because uh, John Stapp was on You Bet Your Life as well. And that's very funny if you find that. And it was, I think, three months after he made his sled test right out here in 1954. Yes, sir. Um, I'm, I'm going to change the subject a little bit away from Glenn. Okay. But you put a slide up there that showed the orbital track as the way back uh, as the uh, uh, crap. There it is. As it's going around the Earth, can you explain why this is a sine wave? I've seen the same thing with the ISS. What? What? I don't know the first thing about orbital mechanics or anything, but why? Why is it not just a straight line? Why That's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know? Yeah. It's because you're projecting it on a flat surface on yeah. a flat yeah. mass. So, so and also like, the Earth oh, is oh, the Earth oh. is tilted, the rotation, right. the way that it goes, so, you know, the, with the Earth being tilted when you launch up, as you go around it, you know, so with the Earth being tilted as you're rotating around, it's going to change that. And it's going to be a sine wave. So. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, okay, well, it's. <laughs> okay, well, once again, uh, thank you for coming. That anniversary takes place on January the 16th, 24 years ago. Kathy's going to tell you who's on first next month.